TFC. Bueno, muchas gracias por la invitación. Um, hey, inmediatamente, um, I have to, me disculpe en la imposición de inglés. <laughs> Mi español es muy inegal, depende mucho de la calidad del café, de muchas cosas. Okay, so since you are international school and using uh, English, uh, I, I, I'm happy to use English as well. Uh, Luis, thank you very much for this introduction and for the invitation. Luis and I met one year ago in Madrid uh, in the school um, in a very nice occasion, the presentation uh, of uh, a book on Carno Lasso, um, one of the, I have wrote one of the introductions and among my many, many interests is uh, uh, the history of modern architecture in, in Spain uh, of, uh, of many generations, <laughs> uh, very much so of the 1950s. I'm fascinated by De La Sota particularly, but over the years in collaboration with uh, El Croquis in the 90s, I wrote, I don't know, 15, 20, issues uh, looking at the then contemporary situation um, uh, of, uh, of Spanish architecture, um, uh, covering a wide geographical range. And the approach that I tried to bring um, to the history of architecture, to the criticism of architecture, and to the te teaching of architecture is to say that the work itself is a kind of thought uh, the, the, I wrote a piece which I've sent to our students, uh, architectural ideas, ideas on architecture and architectural ideas. Ideas on architecture could be theory, engineering, this and that, but architectural ideas are the generating um, ideas of, behind projects. And these are not literary ideas, they're not mathematical ideas, they are in the realm of space, of imagination, of intuition, uh, of concepts in another sense. And this is what really interests me, is to penetrate buildings of whatever period to the underlying anatomy of thinking. Uh, and this is what we're doing very much in our group, uh, combining case studies and also uh, uh, visits. So that's the spirit in which my visit is taking place. But I wanted to mark the visit with uh, two contributions to your library. Uh, one, the second edition of the book, Le Corbusier, Ideas and Forms, uh, and the other, thank you for mentioning my other activity, Abstraction y Luz, Abstraction and Light, Dibujos, Pinturas, Fotografías. This is a book, not a catalogue, it's much more than just a catalogue, uh, with my work in various media and with some wonderful texts by other people, including a great preface by Alvaro Cesar, who's my uncle, uh, artistically, Tio. <laughs> <laughs> and Juan, Nav Juan Navarro Valdevec is my brother, artistically. So I'm very lucky in my uh, family. <laughs> so um, today I want to, um, in the same spirit, uh, reflect upon um, the question of how uh, we can learn from you know, a master or from major works or, and how others have done it. Um, what's involved in uh, absorbing and transforming uh, uh, seminal works. When a, when a work is created, it comes out in a particular condition. People talk about it in the terms of that time, but a major work transcends time, is reinterpreted, reread, and a sort of uh, metamorphosis can take place. Sometimes this is just a devaluation into cliche or to neo-modernism or whatever, but at a much deeper level, there are reinterpretations that go on in a kind of string uh, of, 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 of historical moments. Um, so I've chosen Corbusier because, uh, but I could really do this with Kahn or Alto or even Nice, but Corbusier uh, is particularly rich in this uh, respect. Um, and so in the first uh, a few minutes, I want to say a few words about Corbusier and about my general approach uh, to him before then going into the question of his reception and transformation in totally contrasting ways. There's no one Corbusier. 
He's not a monolith. <laughs> He's a highly complex universe, a, create, a creation of a universe of, of ideas and forms. And some of them are contrasting. He's an architect of polarities. So when someone says, well, the real Corbusier is this, I'll say, no, the real Corbusier is also that. And this is part of understanding the richness of, of his inheritance. Um, this is uh, Le Corbusier's self-portrait in the door in Chandigarh um, in India, uh, where he, uh, he was known as a, a, a corbeau, a, a crow, uh, and uh, it's a sort of uh, uh, you know, self-portrait. Self um, he's an enigmatic individual. I've never been, I'm not really interested in the personality of Corbusier or the gossip. I'm interested in the life of forms, not the, the life of the, of the architect. Um, but I want to say a few words about how I became captivated by Le Corbusier. And this started uh, very young, age 15, uh, in where I was at school, which was actually, it turns out, a Benedictine school. Um, and very surprisingly, it had a, an incredible collection of modern art. And one day I was in the library, supposed to do calculus, but was so bored. Instead, I was always looking for other distractions and came across these strange books with cloth, and red lettering. Uh, what is this? Opened it. And there were these black and white pictures of villas and black cars of Indians in turbans and rough concrete. It was the universe of Le Corbusier. <laughs> I was captivated uh, and uh, studied, uh, in fact, did very, bad, did very badly in the calculus, <laughs> but discovered my, life, uh, my life's work, which is more important. Huh? Uh, and um, I said, so I have to go and see this. So I decided to hitchhike. Uh, I live in Southeast, uh, I did live in Southeast England, to hitchhike uh, to France, to go to Ranchon, a pilgrimage, in fact, peregrination. Well, I was a very bad hitchhiker in those days. I, I became very professional later. But so I only got as far as Paris, which meant that the first uh, Corbusier building I saw was this, the Pavillon Suisse, the Swiss pavilion in the Cité Universitaire. And I was captivated by the experience. Um, always with me, the experience is extremely important. Uh, you know, buildings speak to me. If they don't speak to me, I don't write about them. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And I can't tell you exactly what it was. I was an innocent, but looking at this incredible thing floating in space, these muscular piloti, as they, they're called, uh, haunted me. I thought this is really something. It was the beginning of an adventure, a life adventure. Uh, Corbusier is part of my existence. Uh, uh, I live in France. Uh, um, I've often uh, uh, taught uh, courses where we visit buildings together, which is a very nice thing. And I think in your school, you do go to La Tourette, which is a wonderful idea to actually inhabit uh, a building. Uh, and um, over the years then, um, uh, Corbusier has uh, been quite central. When I went to America to study at Harvard, the first afternoon coming in from the airport, I was with a friend and we drove past Harvard Yard and there was Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts, the one building in the United States by Corbusier. And I thought, aha. <laughs> the next day I went and investigated and investigated and to cut a long story short, it became the subject of my first book, which is referred to here, um, which was uh, Le Corbusier at Work, the genesis of the Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts, an immensely detailed reconstruction of the design process uh, of that building. And uh, not just the design process, but the process of thinking and ultimately the process of construction, of making is a highly detailed, fully documented uh, history. And one of the talks I gave in our group, uh, our um, uh, master's group was in fact called uh, Le Corbusier at Work, a very detailed. Among other things, it's an interpretation of drawings and what drawings can tell us about the thinking process of, of, uh, of an architect. So there have been many books and many editions and so forth. This is the one I've just given you, which was a totally revised uh, edition of the earlier book, um, which the earlier book exists in Spanish, Ideas y Formas, Herman Blume. 
Um, <clears throat> but I added a great deal, including a whole section at the end on principles and transformations. And chapter 20 is called On Transforming Le Corbusier. So it's about this whole question of prototypes and transformations. And I want to read you um, as a kind of motto for this talk, a passage from George Kubler, The Shape of Time, a really marvelous book on the shape of traditions. He says, every important work of art can be regarded both as a historical event and as a hard won solution to some problem. Other solutions to this problem will most likely be invented to follow the one now in view. As the solutions accumulate, the problem alters. The chain of solutions nonetheless discloses the problem. So it's the question of prototypes, which is basic to all traditions, uh, primary inventions and transformations. So I have always been interested in the transform transformative aspects of Corbusier's imagination um, in buildings. Uh, over the years, I became also very involved in India, um, not just modern India, but also you know, ancient architecture in India. Chandigarh is almost a, a, another home of mine, as is Ahmedabad. And I've always been interested in how Corbusier reacted to different settings. And for example, I did a show Oh, 40 years ago in, in, in Harvard, um, Fragments of Invention, um, the sketchbooks of Corbusier. The sketches reveal so much about the way he looks at the world and, and uh, the metamorphosis. Corbusier gets architecture from anything and everything. He's, he's like Picasso, you know, he steals from here, from there. Uh, a, a drawing of a village in, in the Punjab of horns uh, gradually transforms into an abstract shape through painting. Remember, he's always painting and then architecture. So we're dealing with metamorphoses with, with Corbusier. Uh, and then there's just the sheer presence of these buildings. I mean, the parliament in Chandigarh, I guess I reckon is my favorite Corbusier building. Uh, but here you have it, it's majestic and yet very humane. Uh, this little girl playing <laughs> is completely at ease there uh, with this thing in the background. Um, transformations, invention, uh, the section, and then uh, you see the, um, the cooling towers uh, here, something that fascinates him. He's uh, trying to solve the problem for expressing the um, uh, chamber of uh, the assembly and always at the back of Corbusier's mind uh, is the past. Uh, he wrote in, in 1929, the year of the Villa Savoie, if I have one teacher, it's the past. Um, now this is you know, not what people expect uh, from uh, a modern architect, but this is the case with Corbusier, constantly absorbing and transforming. This is the light ray in the parliament uh, with uh, the Pantheon, obviously is one of his obsessions. Villa Savoie, which we all know, this is actually one of my own photographs. Um, and again, I've been always interested in the drawings, uh, in exploring um, how and why um, uh, he did things the way he did. He said, to fix a plan is to have had ideas and uh, to express an intention. And this is the area that I've always wanted to investigate. But at the same time, if we can say uh, Corbusier works with the unique, uh, there are also systems, uh, there's the general language. There is always the particular, the unique and the generic. Um, and the generic means elements and types, um, whether it's the, um, the Domino 1914 skeleton, which is the genotype of his whole language in a sense, or its transformation into the five points of architecture, or uh, you see the grouping there of uh, these various transformations of that concept uh, into um, the, you know, the, the five points of a new architecture, the piloti, the free plan, uh, the free facade, uh, the roof terrace, et cetera. And then variations on the theme for the villas of the twenties. And then always at the back of his mind, um, types in, in the history of, of architecture, whether it's Greek temples, and objects, industrial objects, and the fusion between the two. So this is the Corbusian universe. Um, so while I'm very interested in the particular quality of the works, I'm also interested in uh, the generic language. 
and of course his investigation uh, of the of the past, his obsession with the Acropolis, for example, which remains with him all of his life and keeps coming up and coming up and coming up. These are just brief sketches uh, of my interest in Corbusier before I come to the real substance of this talk. Um, these are all places which haunt me. Uh, this is the roof terrace uh, at the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille, um, which is uh, kind of devoted to the Mediterranean myth. Uh, he calls this an Acropolis. Um, it's uh, one of these sort of, uh, you have to go there and experience this uh, piece of land art in relation to the horizon, the mountains, uh, and so forth. So <clears throat> here he is contemplating uh, antiquity at the age of 24. Um, at, but this process just goes on and on of going back to things and pulling them forward. Then it's the absolute primary um, uh, investigation of uh, fundamental values of light, proportion, and so forth, um, which are among the things which transmit to other people. So we're coming to the general point. So here is this body of work. Uh, here is this universe, which includes buildings, paintings, writings, sketches, projects not built, projects built, uh, an enormous uh, uh, constellation of, of concepts. Um, so what does the rest of the world do with them? Uh, what do other architects do? Well, of course, some are completely dominated by Corbusier and they produce Neo Corbusier. Uh, some people um, ignore him completely, it's of no interest to them, or they criticize him. Um, but those who are drawn to him uh, how, how does this work? I wrote a piece in the late 90s called Le Corbusier, uh, Objectif et Miroir. Uh, Le Corbusier, a mirror and a lens, to say that one of the ways that people uh, discover themselves is through uh, primary objects or through a, a master, through masterpieces. You, you find out who you are by bouncing off a major work. At the same time, through that, a lens, you discover generic solutions to problems. This is the way that influence works. I don't like the word influence. It implies a one-way channel. What we're dealing with is reciprocal, is rereading and transforming. This is La Tourette uh, at uh, 2011, uh, April the 4th at uh, 11.17 a.m. <laughs> Uh, a, a second later, it's not exactly the same. Uh, you've been there, this extraordinary symphony of, of, of light. So, Rochamp, you'd say, completely unique, in, un, inimitable uh, solution to the problem of a pilgrimage church. Now, we can all go there. We can all have our different reactions to it. We can investigate its history, which is extremely interesting and complex. But what fascinates me is to see how different architects have reacted to Ronchamp uh, in, in ways that are totally contrasting. Um, <clears throat> about, uh, well, actually, uh, nearly 30 years ago, I was in, in Bilbao at the invitation of the mayor uh, when all those projects were, were presented. And I had uh, breakfast with, uh, with Frank Gehry, um, who was very happy because we'd selected him uh, for uh, a prize in, in, in Israel, the Wolf Prize. Um, and he said, well, Bill, I'd like to have breakfast with you and blah, blah, blah. You live in France. I said, yes, I live in France. He said, well, you know, I lived in France for a year. I said, no, I didn't know that. And he said, really, two of my prime inspirations are in France and they're with me every minute. Okay, Frank, well, what were they? And I was half guessing actually, but anyway, he said, well, uh, one of them was Ron Sharp. I said, well, of course, you know, he said, uh, these are his words. He said, without Ron Sharp, there's no Frank Gehry. Now I like that, especially with all the stupidity of avant-gardist rhetoric around uh, Gehry. So he's deeply involved with, with reading architecture in a, it doesn't always succeed in, but I'm just saying, those are his words, without uh, Ranchamp, uh, there's no Gary. I said, well, what's the second building? Uh, he said, well, it's Chartres. It's the, the great lofty space of Chartres. And I said, well, okay, Bill Bauer, it's not quite as good as Chartres, is it? But uh, 
<laughs> this is the direction uh, that he was thinking. And I said, well, I mean, can I ask you what about Ranchamp? He said, well, it's that incredible exercise of internal external space of light uh, and of the projection of the volumes into the landscape. So it's the sculptural drama. Okay, fast forward. I am in uh, uh, Osaka interviewing uh, Tadewando uh, for El Croquis. And through translation, well, uh, I've been looking at a, a lot of his work. I always looked hard at the work before doing any of those articles. And in the interview, I said, well, Mr. Ando, everybody knows you're very interested in Japanese tradition and so on. But you also traveled in Europe on several occasions when you were very young. And I wanted to ask you about Western architecture. What are your primary inspirations? And then there was a silence and which was Ranchamp. I said, I thought so, Ranchamp, yeah, okay. Okay, and then Pantheon. Okay, all right. So we have, <laughs> I said, okay, well, translation please. Well, Mr. Ando says that Ranchamp is his primary inspiration. I said, yeah, but what? He said, peace, meditation, light, space total contrast to the way that Mr. Gary looked at it. Now, that's what interests me. Uh, both are correct. You can find both of those things in the same prototype. It's a very rich prototype. The important thing here is mirror and lens, is projection and transformation. And I said, Pantheon? Yes, he said, I love the Pantheon, not because it's a classical building, but because it abstracts light. And he said, the translation was, for the abstraction of nature, the ray of light, the gravity of light. Now that's that's this is what, now we're talking architecture. This is what I mean by architectural ideas. Okay, so <clears throat> what we have is actually a string of solutions and transformations uh, which go place, which constitute what I've always called a modern tradition, which has many directions. It's like a delta, but things. Uh, a red, the loops back, pull forward, mannerisms, this, that, the other. Alvaro Siza, my, my uncle. <laughs> when uh, this is the church, Marco de Canaveses, 25 years ago. Another interview this time for El Croquis. I said, Mr. well, Alvaro, let's talk about your, your church. And uh, it was fascinating. He said, well, the original client, uh, the bishop, Bishop Rick, I guess it was, said, uh, well, we think a church is like a social center. Uh, you know, there'll be people playing guitars and there'll be psychotherapy sessions. And I don't know what he said, what? He said, and he was brought up as a Catholic and of course rejected the whole thing. He said, no, no, we have to have a church. We have to have a cross. We have to have all the traditional things. <laughs> and so this debate took place and he said, so I had the task of mediating between, you know, different visions of what a church should be. And, um, you know, he said, I, I wanted to go back to the core of what a church is, which is about light and assembly uh, and so forth. And of course he examined prototypes. He always does in a very intelligent way. And he said, how can you possibly think of designing a church without thinking about, you have to think about Ranchamp. You can't not think about Ranchamp. He said, how can you do it without thinking about Barragan, the Capuchin in, in, uh, in south of Mexico City? Um, even Alto, as I'll show you in a minute. And uh, then there was the question of the cross crucifix, um, which um, is a very difficult problem. How do you do a good cross? Uh, I think that um, when... Um, when confronted with all the traditional symbols and the traditional um, elements of a church, the font, uh, the doors, the, uh, the altar, um, the, um, you know, let's say the standard uh, typology of a, of a Catholic church. He said the most difficult thing of all was the cross. Now, two days ago, we went to see uh, Aranzazu, the church, 
and which is an extraordinary um, uh, reinvention of a, of a church uh, on many levels and of the, all, all the elements, the, the apps, the, the, the aisle, the nave, uh, nave, a ship, uh, the choir, the most inventive choir I've ever seen, actually, uh, which makes, a, therefore, a, a two-ended uh, uh, a church. But there's a complete collapse when you get to the cross. It just has the most boring crucifix with a Christ on it that you'd find in any church anywhere. It just is, has none of the intensity of the rest of the world. In fact, probably he was told, don't touch it. That's what we're doing. It's what you would find in any parish church anywhere in Spain. Now, I was fascinated by that because in all kinds of other ways, uh, uh, the, the artists involved, whether they were uh, uh, Oteiza or, or uh, uh, you know, in, in his way, Chalida, were invited to reinvent, but they're not. So how did, um, unfortunately, I don't, you can only just see the cross in the distance there. But uh, Caesar said, so I went to stay in La Tourette. And in La Tourette, of Corbusier, there's an extraordinary steel cross which just resonates with the whole space. And he said, only gradually did I realize how I wanted to do a cross in wood uh, in this particular building. At the same time, he was fascinated by Alto. And Alto in the Three Crosses Church, which is from the mid fifties, no, there's no doubt in my mind that he was reacting to Corbusier. He was, he was in a kind of friendly competition with Corbusier all his life. <laughs> and I think when he saw uh, Ronchamp and he did this at Imatra in the Eastern part uh, of, uh, of Finland, um, he, this was his answer uh, really to doing that. So this is what I mean by a tradition. It's a string of, of uh, inventions and connections. The church in La Tourette is a severe, very um, beautiful space of concrete and light and especially shadow, which actually floats, it floats on light. Uh, now this severe church has been the inspiration for generations of religious spaces and in many parts of the world, and not just Catholic. This is, for example, um, the Holy Cross Funerary Chapel at Turku uh, by Pitkenen, a great, a great work, 1967. And who saw it? Tadeo in his first trip, he went both to La Tourette and to, and to this, and was very, very influenced uh, uh, by it. Well, you can see, obviously, the kind of resonances with La Tourette, with light, with material, and with immaterial, uh, with the intangibility, if you like, uh, of atmosphere. Khan could not have been Khan without Le Corbusier. Uh, he actually said as much. Uh, now, it doesn't mean he imitates Corbusier. It means he took on board uh, the aura uh, uh, many of the devices of Corbusier, the Salk Institute is an extremely intelligent reinterpretation of the concrete work of the Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts of Corbusier. But above all, um, Corbusier's deep interest in the past. Uh, Kahn invents a modern architecture, which is in a certain sense, archaic. This is the Salk Institute uh, in La Jolla from the 1960s uh, with this projection uh, of infinite space towards the horizon and uh, they play with voids uh, and an intense materiality. Now, um, you know, there are a few local examples we could be talking about. <laughs> uh, yesterday, uh, we went with the students uh, to um, the, uh, the museum on the hill. <laughs> Oteiza. I'd been once before about 15 years ago. Going back to it, I was astounded by the extent to which there are resonances with, with Le Corbusier. Um, and um, I'd never really thought uh, so much about that aspect of Orteza uh, before. There are the obvious things uh, to do with skylights, um, uh, which uh, you know, were back to the light cannons on the side of La Tourette, uh, uh, which are, are here. Whoops, I'm sorry. And then, you know, yeah the ramp, uh, the promenade architecturale, um, and on it goes, on and on. So this is uh, a reinterpretation uh, around, obviously, another 
um, uh, another program. Now, is the, the skylights uh, inconceivable without the example, I would think, of, of, of La Tourette? This is La Tourette in the crypt. And then in a way, it's also a reinterpretation of Otez as uh, voids and volumes in the actual form of a building. But once one solution is in place, others become possible. The most eclectic modern architect is, of course, Rafael Moneo. Moneo has an eye which remembers. <laughs> uh, he has a, a way of collecting knowledge and then juggling with it and transforming it and fusing it uh, in uh, terms of new intentions. Well, yesterday, having been in the museum, I thought, well, wait a minute, this reminds me of something else, which of course is the building in Palma, Mallorca by Moneo. Now, Moneo had a very difficult problem, which was to uh, <clears throat> place a building in such a way that uh, it would block out a rather ugly foreground and link you to the horizon um, and create a kind of corridor to the very beautiful uh, Miro uh, studio uh, at the back. It's a very ingenious solution. Now, <laughs> Moneo often, either consciously or unconsciously, reverts to earlier solutions in the history of architecture and then works around them, sometimes reworking them, inverting them, um, sometimes probably not fully consciously. The plan is a very ingenious fusion of two tropes or types in the history of modern architecture. One is, is La Tourette the chapels breaking away from the volume of the church. The other is Alvaralto's libraries, which all are variations on a bar, a fragmentation into a social space and often um, going down um, to a lower level. One could go on and on about the very sophisticated reworking of Utson's windows in the house uh, on Mallorca, uh, fortifications, um, of course, a kind of uh, uh, a nod to the abstraction of, of, of Miro. Um, but the point I'm making is that we have here a string of solutions. And I think this is in a way his answer to uh, his former, former master, <laughs> uh, Sayan Soisa. That's what a tradition is, uh, it's the way it works including this extraordinary solution of the, the floating objects uh, when you come through um, with a view, uh, cutting out the, the foreground, linking the water to the distant uh, uh, horizon. I had, a, again, those conversations from the time of El Croquis in the 90s are quite interesting documents when I look back, did a very long, intense um, uh, interview with uh, Rafael Moneo, uh, at the time of the Corsal, and we were talking about modern sculpture, and especially the site of the Corsal, you know, the relation to the sea, the, the, um, and I said, well, you know, it was the only project that broke away from the structure of the city and engaged with the landscape. Uh, that's, that's the strength of it, is that it exploded and engaged it was a landscape project. Um, we're talking uh, about an architect who's uh, deeply inspired by Utzen, especially he worked even on the, on the opera house platforms and so forth. But I said, you know, it's uh, always struck me as it's resonant in some way with Chalida, who's at the other end of the bay, <laughs> the comb of the winds. And he said, see, 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 see. He said, but you know, he said, I'm really more interested in Oteisa. Oteisa is, is, is the inspiration for me. And I said, why? And he said, voids. It's the capacity to generate active voids that makes for him, you know, well, in fact, this is really what Oteisa is, is uh, at, at his best. It was interesting going back and looking at the early works of Orteza, which are mm -hmm, so-so really, frankly. <laughs> and suddenly with steel, 
he becomes Ortesa, and then we're off. And then we're into a fantastic world of invention, which, you know, every generation of Spanish architects has been touched in some way or another. I remember another conversation, Nieto Sobejano, how much they have been indebted to Ortesa. Of course, it's very risky to start making architecture uh, that is too directly involved with another art form. You have to have a complete transformation into the language of architecture. And I was wondering with Oteisa, what happens to them if you make them bigger? At a certain point, you destroy them. The sculpture can only work at a certain scale, and then it, it doesn't. Chalida, you can go bigger than Oteisa, in my opinion. Anyway, a réfléchir. <laughs> Okay, back to the domino, back to the genotype. Well, in Corbusier's language, it's at the basis of his system of the free plan. This is the, the housing in Stuttgart, uh, the free facade, the strip window, the cantilever, the, uh, you know, it's an instrument of modernization, even on a very large scale. Project for Algiers, 1931, it's like a domino uh, repeated 150 or 1,000 times to make that great uh, urban viaduct almost a landscape piece uh, proposal for, for Algiers. The, the, the plan Obus, the plan Obus. It's at the basis of the villas, uh, Villa Stein at Garch. Um, and what I'm interested in here is the exploration of the concept of the free plan, which I presume you've all uh, you know, know about and even used in your, in your work. And if you haven't, you should be thinking about it. So this is the plan of, of Garch, of the Maison Stein. You come in. It's, of course, a promenade, architectural. You come in under the canopy. And then you go around. And then, uh, excuse me, here, uh, in under the canopy. And then around and up. And then, you know, you have these partitions uh, which are uh, arranged within the space with some expression of the structure. Now, this concept is a concept. It's not, you know, reliant on one building. It is a principle, is what we could call it. Um, and I think one needs to think about principles uh, in, in architecture, which have this generic definition. So he makes it into this version of a villa. But what happens when Alto comes along, who is absolutely captivated by the Maison Stein at Gauch when he goes there in 1928, totally obsessed with it. And he does the Villa Maria 10 years later uh, in a totally different context. But look at the plan. What he's done is exploded it. Uh, and he's made a free plan, goes into the surrounding space with an entryway, <laughs> a pavilion, a series of moves across space, the promenade architectural, the pool at the back, and so forth. In this case, partly influenced by biomorphic abstract art. Uh, it, it's, uh, of course, a much more rustic building, deliberately so, and yet, in the background, there's still the resonance chamber uh, of Le Corbusier's Villa Stein at Gauss. What happens when the free plan hits the tropics <laughs> and goes to Brazil? Well, Niemeyer knows what to do. <laughs> um, here we are, 1941, I guess, the casino at Pampulha, uh, a quite fabulously playful and elegant building, an astonishing space. And now he really goes to town. You know, this is, um, you know, uh, he, this is the musician who takes the whole few further still than even Corbusier. In fact, teaches Corbusier quite a lot about what can be done with the free plan. And not only that, but of course, it has these metallic piloti, which add uh, luster, light, and also it is a casino. You know, you have to imagine this with, a, I don't know, hispano Suizers coming in the evening, pulling up, people in elegant clothes moving up, and the ballroom up above with the glass floor. Um, I had the experience of giving a lecture in, in, in that building, in the, in the ballroom uh, 15 years ago. And uh, it was a wonderful Congress about uh, Brazilian modern architecture. 
and we were all put in direct uh, visual contact with, with, with Nimaya, who was sitting in the garden of the house in Canoas. Um, he said it was too much for him to come. Uh, it was too tiring to travel to Pampoya. So one by one, we addressed this figure who was a huge face on the screen. Um, he looked a bit like Mussolini, actually, with the chin and so forth. Um, I have a photograph of Niemeyer as an enormous ghost uh, on that screen as we all sat in, in, in this place. But the building is taking a system and extracting new potentials from it uh, in the service of a new myth, a new dream, a new intense intensity. It doesn't stop. Uh, eventually, he explodes it even further into, of course, a series of organic metaphors, uh, which are reliant, among other things, on um, Alto as an intermediary. Uh, this is the, the house at Canoas, um, which I'm sure you all know, which is a uh, extraordinary um, intervention in a natural landscape. But if we just look at that plan and go back to that, that's the intermediary of, in the research of the, of the free plan. Now it becomes something extruded into nature. Um, some years ago, I went to visit the Casa Ugalde, um, which is, I think, one of my two or three favorite modern buildings in Spain by Coderre. <laughs> And the owner was very pleased to share the building with me and with the friends who I was with. And we had the third edition of my book on modern architecture there. And uh, he wasn't thinking and he uh, opened it and he said, oh, this is the page with the plan of our house. Could you sign your book here? I said, si, senor, but it's not your house. That is the plan of the Villa Maria. Oh, <laughs> okay, point made. So, <clears throat> all right, the domino. Let's explore the slabs and the things that they can become. Well, they can become a lot of different elements. Dennis Lasden, uh, the most, uh, to me, significant British architect in the 20th century, along with Lubeckin, much more interesting to me than Sterling, actually, but that's a, a judgment. And actually, you know, he was a friend and I've written books about him. But here we have the National Theatre in London. Now, the National Theatre works with a series of platforms and levels, or what he calls strata, notice the geological term, linking the building to the city. It's partly an idea of theatre, urban theatre, where the outside world becomes the backdrop, and then you penetrate and go through to the inner theater. It's rhythmic, uh, it's a, a rather severe monumentality, very influenced by the English Baroque, particularly Hawksmoor, but profoundly classical. I've put there a detail of a classical moldings um, because this is all going on, but at a rather larger scale. Um, <clears throat> So what we got then is a, a reinvention of the principles of the domino around uh, a monumental and public scale uh, of architecture and with a compression and expansion of space, which has a lot to do with the English Baroque, but also with Wright, uh, his interpretation of Wright. And here's this marvelous section, which tells the whole story um, of the strata. And then the section going right through inside theater, you turn it out again and it goes to the outside theater. So it's really an image of a public building, an idea uh, of uh, uh, city and theater as two uh, connected concepts. But supposing we explore another uh, version of the domino with Le Corbusier uh, as, a, as, a, as a help. This is the <clears throat> Villa Chaudan by Corbusier, 1954, in Ahmedabad. Now, when Corbusier went to India, he realized the climate was uh, you know, a major issue, uh, and he generated the notion of the parasol, uh, the protective roof uh, for shade, and the open facade with brisole uh, for shading and also for trans, trans ventilation. Uh, you know, his, this is the back of the Mill Owners Association building. This was the Villa Chaudan. These are all 1953-54. Uh, 
that starts a whole range of connections in Asian architecture. Uh, the so-called uh, Sky House by uh, uh, Kitatake, 1958. On the other hand, the concept, the concept of the parasol or the shelter can become monumental. Uh, and in the hands of Corbusier, actually, when he did the Palace of Justice, uh, which you see here, um, he, in the black and white one, <laughs> He said, I want to take the parasol and monumentalize it to express the shelter and protection and majesty of the law, his own words. Teodoro Gonzalez de Leon uh, in the 1980s for the Palacio de Justicia Federal, Mexico City, uh, profoundly Corbusian architect, but never neo-Corbusian, had worked with Corbusier in the late 40s, uh, develops his own language of monumentality using direct concrete and uh, uh, pulls together the ideas of pergola, of uh, the protective parasol, and of, in a, way, a curious way, a fusion of Corbusier and of his reading of Mesoamerican pre-Columbian architecture in an astonishing synthesis. I think this is actually a masterpiece, this building. And it astounds me to, I remember when I invited uh, Teodoro to give a talk in, in the United States, in Washington, in St. Louis, and they'd never heard of him. And then you think of all these poor people having to listen to Peter Eisenman uh, or, you know, these stupid little neo-Corbusian houses in Princeton, New Jersey, and all the blah, blah, blah that goes with it. And so, anyway, that, that's, that's the problem, you know. <laughs> that's the problem. I mean, think of, uh, uh, you know, Santiago de Compostela, which has been, you know, bombed by uh, Eisenman with a piece of complete rubbish. And then you look at this articulate, brilliant building. Now, anyway, th this is why we, as historians and critics, have to keep balancing the agendas uh, geographically, among other things, to talk about quality. Okay, sermon over. So, um, <clears throat> but, you know, the pergola can become very delicate. Um, this is one of my favorite buildings in the United States. I discovered it by accident in 1984. It's outside Tucson, Arizona, and it's known as the Ramada House, a Ramada, a shelter, designed by Judith Chafee, who was a wonderful architect and a wonderful person. And here um, we're dealing with um, a house in the desert with a protective shading device, uh, a pidoti of a certain kind in wood, and then a secondary system underneath, a free plan, in fact, reinvented, but done with a, 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 an imitation of adobe brick with a, a wash. Uh, it has an extraordinary effect on the senses, breathes very easily with the cactuses, with the surroundings. And here we have another interpretation of a free plan, but via a kind of a slightly rustic language with a lower landscape, uh, and with, you know, reference to archetypes in the Southwest. Uh, these uh, devices here were not only used by the, you know, the, the Spaniards, but also by the indigenous peoples. They had these, these shading uh, uh, devices in that part of, uh, of, of the desert uh, of Southwestern United States. And uh, the result then is a very evocative building, but let's be reminded that in the United States in the late 40s and early 50s, um, a figure like Paul Rudolph uh, was already generating what he called a tropical regionalism. This is for a wet climate on the right, and this is for a dry climate on the left. And, and it turns out that actually um, uh, uh, Chafee was uh, you know, studying at Yale. She was the only woman in her class, if you can believe that, uh, with Rudolph in the 1950s. But it's learned its lessons from Corbusier without in the least bit looking Corbusian. That's the point. So we're talking about principles rather than appearances. The domino, once again, da 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 da. Japan, the media tech at Sendai, um, Toyo Ito. Now, this, this building, which I think is a way, a certain way crystallized, a building crystallized a, a moment in the history of, of architecture, is actually reinterpreting that fundamental uh, skeletal concept 
but in another form and in other materials. Um, the hollow uh, structure, voids, the primary inspiration of weeds in an aquarium, an organic metaphor, but combined with somehow a vision of, you know, a cybernetic reality, an electronic reality, and a, a, a sense of, of modernity as dematerialization, uh, and so forth. Of course, it's not a concrete building, it's actually a, a, a hybrid uh, structure. But the ideas behind it are, in effect, transformations of that basic diagram. So this is what I mean by um, uh, transforming uh, Le Corbusier. Um, and it, it, th these transformations also take place through analogy. Uh, Mies, the Barcelona Pavilion, for example, which is not a domino, but is obviously clearly in the same uh, broad area, but can be reinterpreted and reread. This, for example, is an absolutely fascinating sketch by Paul Rudolph uh, investigating uh, viewing points and in movement through uh, the Barcelona Pavilion, uh, where he, in, in effect, turn, turns it into a free plan Corbusian building through his perceptions. And here is the installation by Sana. You know, there was a series of installations uh, in in the um, in the Barcelona Pavilion, where they insert basically free plan partitions which are transparent and continue that research in their own work. This is the, uh, the museum uh, in, um, uh, in the north of France, uh, which indeed takes uh, the principles of the free plan, but applies them with a very different touch and a different materiality and a different uh, intention. I had the experience uh, several years ago, I'm sitting there with Doshi, and, and uh, we were in the building, of the Mill Owners Association. This is in, in Ahmedabad. But this look at this variations on the free plan. As you move up the building, it's like a ricochet of, uh, of movement um, around and eventually uh, coming to space at the top, a promenade architectural. And as we were moving around the building, we noticed two Japanese people in a very intense conversation, examining the building and sketching it. It was Sana. They'd come to study this thing again and again. In other words, this is their prototype. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's the first time they were going there, if they just knew the building through uh, illustrations before. Obviously, their interpretation has nothing to do with concrete as such. It's about transparency, but I love that. I, the, the idea that these very well-known so-called star architects are coming back nonetheless to consult uh, a primary, uh, uh, you know, a basic uh, demonstration of, of principles. So these buildings are there and you can, you can listen to them or not. Uh, when Cool House was interesting, which was a short period, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he took over the free plan, but he also took over the free section. And I think this very intriguing project for the Grand Bibliothèque in Paris uh, merits attention as a, as a concept. I think it's an immensely interesting thing. Uh, probably just as well it was not built. Sometimes it's better to have a concept in the abstract, but exploring you know, uh, variations on uh, the section, uh, in volume, space, plan, um, I think a very rich uh, uh, idea. Now, when you get to the top of the Mill Owners Association building, Corbusier resolves the free plan in an incredible space where you have this, you know, folding uh, partition and a descending roof, which actually had water above it initially, with the light breaking in. It's a space that's, you know, I would say ahead of its time. <laughs> you know, so, so many things that are presented to you as uh, innovations 
uh, if you have the historian's eye, you say, oh yeah, tell me all about it. You know, when people started going on and on about fragmentation and so on, I said, oh, do shut up. Just go and look at Alto. He knows how to do it, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, when they got involved in complex geometry and so on, I said, well, actually, have you ever been in the crypt of La Tourette, the complex uh, descriptive geometry? Have you ever been up in here? This is 1954, and it's much stronger. But I think um, Richard Serra could not have been Richard Serra without Corbusier's free plans. Uh, you know the Serras in, in Bilbao, uh, the steel pieces, the, the spirals, the ellipses. Um, he was extremely interested in Corbusier's architecture. Uh, and not only that, interested in, in Borromini. Uh, there's a fusion in some of um, the, you know, you think, oh, Serra, it's avant-garde, it's not. Serra was extremely interested in Baroque architecture and particularly in two of the main churches in Rome uh, by Borromini and their geometry and how they work. But he was also, I think, extremely interested in Corbusier's free plan partitions and what, and what they can do, but he does it without a grid. He does it in steel, which of course touches you physically and mentally as you move through. So for the last uh, uh, chapter of this uh, demonstration, as I said at the beginning, Corbusier is no monolith. There are many Corbusiers. He hits many different tones and many different themes and involves different types. He always wants to define a generic solution. Domino was one. The other is the Maison Monol of 1919. The Maison Monol was also to be a low cost housing solution um, with a cheap industrial structure, vaulted. You see a, a view of it here as part of a kind of garden suburb concept uh, at the time. He never succeeded in building it. And what often happens with Corbusier is that he'll have a general proposition for a typology or for a larger solution for urbanism or whatever. He can't build it, but then he'll put that in a microcosm in one of his buildings, uh, in, in a particular building. We're back to the dialogue between the general principle and the particular expression. This is constant tension in Corbusier. So what happens with it? Well. He puts it into different experiments. The Petite Maison de Weekend, 1935, the black and white uh, uh, picture that you see there. Is, uh, what you see is actually a carefully arranged photograph. <laughs> uh, this is a building which uh, uh, no one's seen. <laughs> they all think they've seen it. What they've seen are these photographs in the oeuvre complete, the complete works which are extremely carefully organized scenarios uh, with um, a primitive hut in the distance, uh, a thorny chair, uh, the contrast between um, uh, industrial materials and crude uh, rustic materials, uh, the interplay between inside and outside, and then this low vaulted space. In fact, this was a kind of um, retreat for a wealthy client in the Western parts of uh, Paris where he was an industrialist, where he'd take his mistress. It was a kind of seduction cave or something of the kind. Um, it's a tongue in cheek primitivism. That's to say it's a primitivism of great wit uh, and skill. It, but he never succeeds in finding the generic solution to housing. The nearest he came was in the uh, late 40s, the rock and rob um, holiday housing, where it, it's fused with the idea of, uh, of, of, of a of Mediterranean vernacular. On the other hand, the theme of vaulted uh, chambers or vaulted structures using Catalan vaults is developed in the 50s in the Maison Jaoul, and above all in the Maison Sarabai in, uh, in Ahmedba. This is the other direction. The Chaudan was the domino, and this is, if you like, the monol uh, becoming uh, an ex exquisite building for a wealthy client using direct materials, brick, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this prototype here is hugely important for a whole range of architects, and partly because it played on this uh, interlocking of 
the rustic and the mechanical. Alda Van Eyck, he could not have done his orphanage without that prototype. People listen too much to what Alda Van Eyck says. He said too much. He talked and he talked and he talked and he talked. So then people run around writing PhDs about what he said. Yeah, but what did he see and what did he do? He could not have done that beautiful orphanage without the Petite Maison the weekend as architecture. We're talking about architectural ideas, not ideas on architecture. Uh, actually, it has many, many different influences uh, in, the, in the 50s and even much later, even though it's a building of 1935, but known principally, as I say, through photographs. Corbusier himself develops um, the idea of the vaulted dwelling in this fantastic project, which was never built, of 1942. Um, an agriculturalist estate at Cherchel, which is in Algeria. And uh, just this sketch, <laughs> the power of this sketch, uh, vaulted, but making um, a reinterpretation of what he calls the basic and fundamental Mediterranean forms in the vernacular, uh, in, um, uh, in even you know, Arab houses, in uh, courtyard dwellings and so forth, done with very, very simple uh, materials. <clears throat> he talks about the fusion of tradition and nature and modernity. Now that is the key for a lot of different architects. So one of the things that in interests me is the way that these prototypes leap into different geographical and cultural conditions. So here are two projects from 1979 to 82, one in India and the other in Colombia. The one in India is Sangat, uh, the studio of uh, Balkrishna Doshi, um, who had worked with Corbusier, of course, and had worked with Corbusier in, in, in France and in, in India. And the other is the official guest house of the president of Colombia in Cartagena de Indias by Rogelio Salmona who actually worked in Paris uh, also and was linked to the atelier. Now, what fascinates me is the way that these <laughs> are deeply indebted to the same prototype, just as I said before, uh, Gary and Ando are deeply linked to, to, to Ronchamp. Here, the vaulted type, the typology, goes off into different readings, different mythologies, uh, I would almost say. Starting with Salmona, um, it's an extraordinary um, uh, fusion of ideas of the patio, of monastic architecture, um, of the site, um, of um, resonances with the uh, um, Latin American tradition, which I'll show you in a second, uh, of, uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, cloisters and exquisite materials and construction, which is actually hybrid construction of stone and concrete, and of course of the vaults. It's a Pan-American building, <laughs> um, very much involved with, with, uh, with Ushmal, uh, very much involved at the same time with the tradition of convents and of uh, patio. But the thing that fascinates me about uh, Cartagena de Indias is it's like a quattrocento, a century and a half late in the architecture. It's sort of delayed action quattrocento, very severe. When everybody's going nuts with the Baroque, they're still doing these wonderful quiet stone churches and cloisters. Anyway, you know, it's a poetic distillation of a place, uh, but it creates another place, a mythological place. Uh, for the setting, of course, of uh, you know the reception of the uh, various world elites who come there. Um, so this is Salmona's um, mythologization, if you like, and his use of the resonance chamber of Corbusier uh, to do what he had to do, including the ramp and so forth. Now, we move to the other side of the world, to Ahmedabad, uh, 1979, and Doshi is making not only a studio, but also uh, a kind of um, distillation of his philosophy. 
We have a building which is half underground with vaults which are made from um, uh, pots and fuses. That's partly a handicraft building with concrete covered with broken china, uh, which reflects very well the, the heat, uh, the dust, the water, uh, has a little bit to do with Gaudi, incidentally. Uh, we're in a place where the temperatures are ferocious, uh, you know, the dust storms. Uh, so building partly underground makes a lot of sense. Uh, and he organizes, this is an enclave linked to a garden with um, waterways and channels derived partly from the Indian tradition. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail here because I'm just wanted to make a general point about his reception and transformation of a Corbusian prototype. It's the plan up above uh, where you have actually a promenade, architectural, uh, the old basic lesson of Corbusier. You come in this way, you have a blank facade, you turn, you go on a diagonal, you have this little pond of water, uh, which is a kind of uh, wink to the free plan idea. And then you proceed on a diagonal, an outdoor theater, and you enter the building from the back, then go to the front. As all of Corbusier's, or nearly all of Corbusier's buildings, you go around them and you come back in. The plan integrates many, many memories, uh, partly from Indian temple architecture, um, it's partly his ideas of Indian music, which I won't go into here, but equally uh, it's inconceivable without these prototypes. Um, here is uh, Taliesin West by Frank Lloyd Wright, which uh, Doshi visited in 1958, um, uh, which of course is partly subterranean. It's also a, a sort of desert dream. And over here, Alvaralto studio uh, in, uh, in Helsinki, because he was making a place which was a kind of center of thought of uh, bringing people together. Sangat means uh, bringing people together. I wrote a book about this where I actually had the chance to live in the place as well. The section, uh, partly subterranean, it's a wonderful drawing. You see the, the, uh, the vaults, the water, the gutters, stepping down, And then the view out looking towards the fields. Now there are no fields, there's a constant construction. Uh, it's a landscape building. Um, it's a building uh, which is on uh, the knife edge, on the La Lama, no, between primitivism and modernity. Uh, it's on the knife edge between the rustic, the rural, and the industrial, which is really what Ahmedabad is too, <laughs> as a place, the place of the, uh, uh, the mill owners uh, and so forth. But it's still uh, a city which brought in Corbusier, brought in Khan, with whom uh, also uh, uh, Doshi worked very, very uh, closely. And it's a synthesis of all of these influences in a singular statement, and yet inconceivable without Corbusier's example. And Doshi would say, I couldn't be Doshi without Corbusier. So I'm not advocating that we all go around with hero worship or anything of the kind. That's not the point. The point is that one should know one's tradition, know where things come from. Um, these are studies of uh, the, um, the section and even, you know, investigating the geometry. Uh, and here are echoes from Indian tradition. Uh, the uh, vaulted type and the history of, uh, of architecture, uh, Todra huts and so forth, all of great interest to, to, uh, uh, to Doshi, including what's called the Chatiya halls, which were the uh, Buddhist monastic halls. You know, this was his vision, if you like, of, of uh, his studio, and even memories of the Atelier 35 Rue de Sèvres, where he worked in the early 50s, Corbusier's uh, Atelier. This is a granary uh, from uh, the Tar Desert in the west of India. So both, um, both Salmona and Doshi were involved in a certain research of roots, of sources, of uh, identity, but in completely different ways, in completely different places. 
But part of the uh, means they had to do this was their inheritance from, from Corbusier. And this is, I think, uh, the overall lesson of all of these things, including, you know, Ortez as a, a museum, um, is this capacity to absorb ideas and then transform them. Um, and that to me is what makes Le Corbusier so interesting because uh, his, his, his universe is one uh, full of potential. Uh, it's not a question of uh, modernism or postmodernism or regionalism or blah, 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 stop isms forever and talk architecture. And that means buildings. It's not, it's not, you know, architecture schools um, suffer <laughs> from so much phony theorizing. Uh, and I think buildings uh, have the messages, but that, you know, we're not naive. We go and we investigate them in their context and they have this double identity. There's something in the past, which you need to understand how it happened then. That's me wearing the historian's hat. And yet they're in the present. They transmit the messages of architecture to us when we walk through them. Uh, and it's the putting together of these two things that constitutes a certain sort of wisdom uh, of, of architecture. And for me, um, Corbusier is interesting, not just for Corbusier, but precisely also because of all these transformations. I find it very interesting to realize the extent to which uh, Moneo uh, has been involved in a dialogue, for example, uh, of his own with, with, with Corbusier uh, or Ando in a, a totally different way. Uh, um, th this is part of the sediment that they, the major master leaves uh, behind. And there's nothing unusual about this, actually, if we talk about the history of forms in the long term. Um, if you take the beginnings of the Renaissance tradition with Brunelleschi and Alberti and so forth, uh, they put in place prime objects, primary statements, which are then translated and translated um, into different conditions of Bramante. And, uh, and then Palladio uh, said, well, uh, Without Bramante, I couldn't have been Palladio. <laughs> and without Bramante, I couldn't have looked at Rome the way I did. This is the point also, is, is that uh, Corbusier invented futures, he invented a past present, but he also invented and reinvented the past. And that's the richness of this filter, this great filter of, of a master. This is a sketch I like very much, which is like a soft portrait, the Sphinx, the Corbusier. And then here, uh, the wonderful roofscape of the parliament uh, in, in Shandigo. So that's it. Thank you very much. Questions? No? Preguntas? Questions? Answers? <laughs> Observations? No. See. Si. Yes. Absolutely practical question. Yes, sir. Uh, two of the examples you show uh, is the name of the architect that makes this house in Jackson. In oh, Ch Chafee. C H A F E E. Judith Chafee. Um, I illustrate that uh, house in the third edition of my book on modern architecture in en English and Spanish. Um, it's a fabulous house. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can say I found it by accident. You know, I was giving a lecture in the University of Arizona in, in Tucson. And actually, I'll tell you a story. You can see I love telling stories. And uh, I gave my lecture and then we had a wonderful dinner in the Arizona uh, Country Club. And there was one empty chair at the, at the dinner. And uh, we started the dinner and in came this intense woman and sat down and within three minutes, she was having a flaming row with everybody. And then she walked out and, and so, and then, oh, we're so sorry. Uh, oh, so, oh, I don't, I, I, it's okay. Things happen, I don't mind, you know. Oh, we, we're so embarrassed, oh, okay. So the next day I'm driving with someone around to explore the desert. I love desert environments. And we're driving along. I said, stop, stop the car. She said, what? 
what's that? It was this beautiful thing because it floats in the, in the desert with the plants around it, a horizontal line, the, the cliffs. I said, wow. I said, oh yeah, that, oh, that's the Ramada house. Actually, he said, this is the house designed by that very rude woman yesterday. I said, I don't care how rude she is. She's a great architect. You really think so? Oh, yes. Let's go look at it. I said, that is amazing. And sure enough, we get there, go in and go on. So now in my life, there are these moments of uh, epiphany, you know, and, um, you know, they, 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 they're sometimes without knowing. I mean, I'll give you another example if you can stand listening to my stories. But in 1978, I was in Denmark and um, <clears throat> it was a Saturday afternoon. And uh, we went for a drive uh, to the western suburbs because the person I was with was involved with uh, an American hospital there and had to do something. And we're driving along. And suddenly, here was this extraordinary building. I said, stop the car. So what? I said, look at that. As we got out, went in, it was a church. Said, oh, like this, okay? Stepping like that, like a, you know, a traditional Danish church, but modern. So we went in with my wife, Catherine, and uh, inside there was this beautiful ceiling, curves floating in light, and, ah, and precision of structure, and wonderful mood, marvelous Protestant meeting house, nothing to do with Ronchamp and Catholic mysticism. Or, no, no, there's something else, very cool. Wow, I said, this is really something. I said, you know, this section reminds me of Sydney Opera House. And I said, it must be by a very good follower of Jorn Utzon. <laughs> And we're going out, and there was this, this building was inaugurated in 1970. Jorn Utzon, it is Utzon. <laughs> and uh, I took photographs, and I was teaching in Harvard in those days. And they, I mean, uh, they were going on and on about Aldo Rossi and, you know, this and that, and then Peter Eisenman, Peter, and, you know, the rest of it. And I said, look, to the students, uh, I showed the students the, the, the church. My God, what an art. I mean, one of these guys phoned me at 10.30 at night, said, that lecture you gave has changed my life, this Utzon building. You go and see it. I said, anyway, when I soon after was writing the book on modern architecture, and I wanted to finish with a finale, a building which did all the things that postmodernists were talking about, but did it in great architecture. There's a lot of history in it. It's, it's something that communicates all the things people were going on about, yet it's rigorous, it's structure, it's light, it's, it's a deep sense of the past, of Japan, of this and that. And, and so I put it in as the finale of the, of the book. But that's the, these ep epiphanies, you see what I'm saying? And uh, it, this, uh, it wasn't quite the same thing because uh, uh, the Maravillas Gymnasium uh, by um, de la Sota, I saw a little black and white photograph in a copy of the Architectural Review, 1985, uh, a very nice edition on Spain, um, put together by Peter Buchanan, who was a very perceptive critic. When I first came to lecture in Madrid in 87, in the context of one of my books being translated, uh, Fernandez Galeano said, well, would you like to go and see anything? I said, well, there's this very strange anti-building. <laughs> it's a very strange industrial structure uh, called the Maravillas Gymnasium. And I've just seen a little picture, but I'd, I'd like to go and see it. Oh, we can do that. It was a Saturday morning, you know, lovely. Madrid, December light, it's marvelous. You know, low, deep shadows. I came into that thing, I was blown away said, so this is great architecture out of almost nothing. This is what I love about it. I've been obsessed with uh, that building ever since. So for me, you see, uh, of course I write texts and all that, but at, at, at the heart of it is an impassioned uh, connection with architecture. I, I have no choice about it. It comes in into my nervous system and takes me over. You know, this is the way it goes, whether it's a temple of the 11th century in India or a great modern building or whatever. So uh, it's then when that's happened, then you investigate how, why, et cetera. And it's, uh, you know, the, the, the visit the other day uh, to, the, to the, uh, the church has got me going off on, on uh, uh, Science Day Uisa again. I've never really investigated him seriously. And um, you know, that's an extraordinary work, the, that, that, uh, that, that church, absolutely extraordinary. 
I've always admired the skyscraper in, in, in Madrid. I think he's a sort of up and down architect, but extremely interesting. And the, the building yesterday, well, um, it's a very intelligent interpretation. There's some very troubling things about it. I think the, the, the color and the density of material gets in the way of one's appreciation of, of Oteza. Um, you know, that there's a, a sort of the, the building almost, almost engulfs uh, Oteza. And the, bu the building is very visceral and heavy. Uh, even the ramp is rather monumental. And here are these delicate little pieces in there. The ones at the very top are okay because the light is coming in on them. But there are a lot of, lot of issues. It's, a, it's concept conceptually a, a remarkable building, but is it the perfect setting for thing? The other thing is the views out. I mean, on the one hand, you have the views down onto the forest, but that brings light into your eyes when you want to look at the sculpture, you know? And I think the horizon is not sufficiently celebrated from the interior. You know, the, the linkage to the distance could be giving you more breathing space. Anyway, yak, yak, yak. But, you know, the, <laughs> but the, the uh, interpretation of, of, uh, of o, 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 Oteza and Corbusier together is very clever. You know, I mean, it, it, that's what he's doing there, you know. But I never, never met this gentleman. Uh, uh, I did know De La Sota. I had an extraordinary sort of friendship with this, him in his last years. But uh, Saint Suisa was some, some other uh, area. But I had not thought about it until yesterday evening. Of course, Moneo's building, I always thought about Moneo's building as having a clever relationship to Alto and Corbusier, but I think it also has a relation to Altesa, yeah, including the Bastion and all those things that, uh, uh, that, 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 that go on. So, you know, I think that's the, uh, the now, so what does that mean for architectural education? Um, well, it means uh, that one has to teach the history of architecture in a disciplined manner. Uh, you know, there's no problem. I like the idea of students of architecture learning to write a good intelligent uh, thesis or a paper and a documented analysis. And it's bravo, you know, no problem. But it also means learning really to read buildings and to transform them. And that's one reason I insist on sketching, for example, which I do a lot myself, um, and on um, trying to penetrate to the core ideas, the, the, the core intentions of, of, of a work, because I believe that's what I'm describing here is a linkage of core ideas turning into other things. You see what I'm saying? This is, this is what the message is here, which is also the message of the course that we're doing. Pablo is my, my uh, you know, ally in this uh, thing. So, um, you know, that's, that's the way I'm thinking about things, but it's very involved with the, the knowledge that comes through uh, direct experience. I'm not interested in naive knowledge, you know, oh, this is cool. So, no, you've got to gradually penetrate, think why, how, um, why did this, is this material used here? Uh, why does the stone smooth here, rough there? When you move in, it moves onto wood. Why are some of the planks wide and big and others are narrow? Why is the stone polished over there? How does the light come in? Are there three kinds of light? Why? How do you do it? Blah, blah, blah. So th this, is, this is to me one of the ways one learns uh, um, uh, architecture and develops an architectural uh, 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 culture. Um, so it's a more general idea about architectural education in a, in a way. So that's a, a long answer to her name is Judith Chafee. <laughs> Any other questions? Por favor, don't be timid. I won't be here. I'll be gone. You can ask. See. I had a question, but it's related to what you just said. Um, do you have any advice for beginners? How could one be able to absorb these ideas and transform them? Well, I think the first thing is learning to see, observing. Um, you know, it's you know, it's it's, it's learning to 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 see and and examine what you're looking at and study it. That's the first way into to to knowledge. It's not just received knowledge at that point; it becomes your knowledge. And I think with architecture students, I'm always saying to them, you need to develop your own constellation. You know, I'm, I'm not there to tell you love this and don't like this and do that. You, you do that, you know, you develop your taste, your, 
passion. You, you have your moments of, uh, wow, I love this building or whatever, but you need to learn to record them and internalize them. And, you know, some people would argue they can do that with their, their telephone. I would say maybe some of it, but there's nothing like drawing. There's nothing like the internalization of knowledge that comes from linking, you know, experience, hand, eye, atmosphere, mood. You know, when you do a drawing, you're, 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 you're involved with things that you're not fully aware of. Now, buildings are full of levels that you're not really aware of. They're communicating on uh, perceptual levels, which are not just obvious. But what do I mean by all that? I mean to say that our experience of architecture goes on at a pre-conscious level as well as consciously. It, uh, when, when, uh, uh, when I walked in to the church the other day, I'd seen pictures of it, of course. And I was thinking, hmm, patati, patata. You go in, you go down those steps, boom, boom, boom. these funny you know, doors, and this incredible narthex with steel. I thought, what, what? And this is absolutely bananas to do that, but it's wonderful. And then I stepped in and there's that vision at the end there. It just knocked me, knocked me sideways. I thought, wow, this is very well done. This is very well orchestrated. It just hit me very hard. But then of course I spent a long time figuring out how it's done. You know, what's going on? How does the light hit that relief at the end? What's the relief made of? Or, or detail like at the side of that, he has there are these wooden slats. Now that means you read it, not just as a cut in a wall, but as a piece that's in there. You see, you're gradually figuring out something hit me hard, what hit me hard? You know, what, what, what are the tricks? <laughs> what's going on here? Why is that light like that? Ah, because there's some blue in the, uh, in, in the side windows, you know, you see what I'm saying? So it, it's um, a combination of receiving uh, sensations from a thing, but saying, ah, it's done like that. And learning in a way to analyze that. It doesn't have to be complicated sketches. I actually like all kinds of drawings, you know, uh, and um, drawing is, I don't know how, it, it, what the sort of culture of drawing is in this school, or whether it's very variable according to your professors, but, um, I, I say that, you know, I gave a whole talk about uh, my travel sketches to the, the, the students because I you know, go all over the world with them. And they're very, uh, you know, some of them are in this book, you can even look at them. Um, they're just very fine line drawings trying to distill the essence of, of, of a thing. Uh, drawings, I mean, the experience of architecture um, is something that goes on over time. Uh, it changes by the second because of light. And one of the questions that you must always ask is what's changing and what's not changing? Uh, when you, you look at a building, you know, you say, oh, I draw the plan. A plan is only a rough indication of the essential image of a, of, of a building, the unchanging aspects of it as architecture. So I'm in favor of um, very intense visual training, but it's not just visual because architecture touches us on other senses, you know. Uh, so how do you register that in some way? You see what I'm saying? But I, I do think that um, there's nothing to stop you then reading books about, you know, but you'd be surprised how um, very few books really talk about architecture. <laughs> they talk about everything around architecture. They talk about this, about that, but the, the number of texts that really hit the button, you know, and somehow really sum up buildings is rather few actually, in my opinion. But in my writings, I try very much to put together conceptualization and, and experience and analysis and including, you know, on contemporary uh, buildings. You know, when I find a building that's really extremely interesting, I try to put it in words in, in some way. Now, words is not what everybody does, less and less today. But, uh, you know, in the old days, <laughs> I used to encourage students always to write descriptions of things. When you write a description of something, you're obliged to, to look at it. Um, you know, a long time ago, when I taught in the Visual and Environmental Studies Department at Harvard, uh, introductory courses to undergraduates, I used to start uh, in the first lecture with a, a story about um, a geologist called Agassiz, who came to Harvard in the late uh, 19th century and uh, from Switzerland. And uh, 
he was a, a, a very, very bright graduate student came to see him and said, um, Professor Agassiz, please sit down. And Professor Agassiz, well, I have a theory about, you know, the formation of crustaceans or this or that in uh, blah, 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 blah. Very good, very good. Well, I tell you what, so he takes this fossil, you know, and gives it to the student, you know, fossil with an imprint on the stone. It says, can you describe that for me? And bring me your text next week. You know, this very self-important graduate student thinks, you know, this is beneath me, you know, to do this. So he goes and more or less writes a text and goes back to see Agassiz and says, it's not very good. You've missed this and you've missed that. Go and do it again. And then it, this happens three or four times. And he said, now you've got it. The first thing, young man, is observe. That's how we have science. Now, I've been very interested in these new telescope, you know, this thing that's revealing things about stars. But what are they revealing? You know, those are images of things. And what, what is that revealing? That's the question, you know? So I think that um, just looking and, and seeing and being very aware of, of, of experience, I mean, even very simple things like a step that feels good or a village where the space is good or, or a cafe, which is horrible or whatever, you know, we're taking in this information all the time, but to be a little more self-conscious about it, why is such and such a place why people like to sit over there rather than here, you know, things like that. Utzon, who after all was a great, great architect, um, has a wonderful passage where he's describing people sitting on the rocks by the sea. And he said, that's architecture, the way they configure, you see? So I think, you know, watching people, watching um, interrelations, all architecture is about all of these things, watching light and Above all, be alert, wave. That, that's my advice. Does that make any sense? Oh, good, I'm glad. <laughs> okay, I think people are hungry. No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Pablo, this can now go back into the your mini library. You have a sort of mini library over there. And when I come the second time, I'll... I'll uh, I will do. Not now. Uh, but, uh, we're leaving that for the students to uh, uh, to look at. And I have a copy of this for you, I'm sure, too. Yes, yes. Which one? <laughs> okay, thank you. See, see. Well, it's photography. It's yes, please, yes, please. And it's um, a lot of. Uh, I can show you for me, please. Uh, see, it's it's my then it's my uh, little uh, handbook. And then all kinds of texts about my ideas. That's a kind that's of a That's a kind of a And then, where are the texts? Okay.